Hi, fantasy readers. This is Corinne Norton, your fellow book binger, and you are listening to the Finding Fantasy Reads podcast, where you can test out a new fantasy story every single week to find your next favorite author. I picked today's story because I'm pushing myself outside my normal genres, and I think you all should too. If you like lit RPG, gaming quests, or stories that have some sci-fi crossover, I think you'll get a kick out of the Girl in Bear Cloak Dungeon. And if you don't like those things, I still think you'll enjoy it, because I loved it, and I am not into any of those things. Ben Green is the author of The Girl in Bear Cloak Dungeon, and his storytelling started at a young age when he would tear apart his coloring books and assemble them into crossover stories with lots of drama and lots of glue. He graduated to Star Wars fan fiction as a teen and began creating his own worlds on a brother word processor with a tiny screen and floppy disks. I actually kind of miss those things. There was something satisfying about lugging out the machine and folding down the keyboard and popping in the disc. I wonder if those will come back the way people have been resurrecting typewriters. Anyway, I'll be narrating the story for today. At the risk of sounding slightly mysterious, I'm going to warn you that the story will be best experienced in stereo, which means that if you're anything like me when it comes to listening to podcasts in one ear and listening out for fighting children in the other, you'll need to stick in that second earbud to get the full experience. Stick around to the end or check out today's show notes to see where you can find more from Ben as well as how to enter our giveaway. For now, please enjoy The Girl in Bear Cloak Dungeon by Ben Green. Dungeons are the foundation of Loman society. Everything we hold dear is inextricably connected to their existence. Our sports, economics, religious worship, neighborly conversations, celebrations, even our political structures circle the dungeons like carry-on scavenging for scraps. What makes it this way? One word. Power. Pival Shatterkeg, Chief Historian of the Champions. The Threshold. When I was a little girl, I knew that I would become a paladin. Today, the truth of that dream weighs in the balance. I must do this. The threshold of Bear Cloak Dungeon rises before me. Seventeen separate entrances. I've counted them a dozen times. But how to choose? Unlike other dungeons, there are no doors. The first eight gaping jaws are tucked into the rock at eye level. Rough stairways wind upward on both sides, allowing raiders, like myself, to stand before the other nine openings and look inward toward the darkness. If the threshold itself is this much of a maze, what will the dungeon be like? Scared? My competition says. He's a boy a couple of years older than me, maybe fifteen. His skin is paler than a bleached worm skull. We stand nearly shoulder to shoulder, as if at the start of a foot race. A crowd is behind us. The dungeon keeper is in front of us. Which door will you choose? I ask. He huffs. Think I'm telling you? Then, with a lowered voice, he says, Rogor. My lips curl. What did you just say? You heard me. I turn my shoulders toward him, but find the boy's eyes averted. He wouldn't dare say it to my face. I glance at my father in the crowd. He smiles firmly, wrinkles of concern playing at the corners of his eyes. Our family is from the kingdom of Ingal, deep under the Alaskan Rockies, but I don't know what it's like to be English. Our underground cities were destroyed long before I was born. We were refugees, or in my case, the child of a child of a refugee, not that my father will let me forget that. The boy shifts uncomfortably, trying to grow the distance between us, but staying on his mark. Maybe he regrets calling me a cruel name. Maybe not. I don't care. I have as much right to be a paladin as he does. We've probably had some of the same mentors. Kiddo Bearkeeper, the dungeon keeper, steps closer to us. She silences the crowd, arms stretched outward, beaded bracelets on her wrists, jangling. The path of a paladin requires many unique gifts, she says. Beyond the ten crafts, a paladin must make decisions that reflect the wisdom of every loman under granite. They represent the best of us, the most intelligent, the most creative the most loyal to ideals. As you choose an entrance, know this. Tevlok Bearcloak watches you. She moves to the side and waves us forward. The boy, I don't care his name, sprints ahead, but a second before he enters the fourth entrance to the right, he skitters to a stop. Now who's scared? He should be. 
Choosing a door on the first level would be foolish. Call it intuition. I breeze past him to the stairway. It's so steep I have to claw up the last few steps. The dungeon is daring me to enter, saying, in effect, you'll need real muscles to pass here. Craft comes second. That's fine. Bigger the trap, bigger the treasure. On the very edge of my vision, I catch the boy watching me. I don't give him the satisfaction of an acknowledgement. My shoulders tense as he heads for the stairway. With a deep breath, I expand my senses. Not through craft, just pure perception. I listen beyond the shuffling noise of the crowd. There's a low hum. I smell deeper, pulling in the earth-damp scent of the rock itself. My fingers trail against the stone between two doors, and I let my hand hover in the emptiness of the second one. There's a slow pressure against my palm. As I move in front of the third door, the boy's footsteps sound behind me. Are you following me? I say. It's an accusation, but a fair one. I, a pause. Tracking is a time-honored strategy, he says. Think it through. If we go in at the same time, through the same entrance, Bear Cloak may pit us against each other. I tighten my stare at him. You don't want that. After a glance at the crowd, he rolls back his shoulders. I'm not afraid. My attention returns to the entrance. I need more information. Does darkness matter? This one feels, if not looks, less able to absorb the surrounding light. Paladins use more than investigation, more than craft. They rely on intuition. So that's it. Out of 17, this one is the right one. Follow me if you dare, I say, and pass under the darkness. Bluecraft, Metcraft, and Timecraft Bear Cloak is a labyrinth of tunnels. No matter what direction I take, a thin pipe of white neon light follows me at the top of the cave. The air is warm and humid, drawing out beads of sweat on the back of my neck, dampening my hair. The darkness I sensed in the doorway is gone. But the boy is not. He's five, no, six bars behind. I pick a side tunnel leading upward. I have to use my hands to climb the slope. I chose this direction because of the way the light falls on the rough steps not because I'm hoping he won't follow. That would be a bonus. But he still follows me. Bear Cloak won't like that, I call back to him. His voice echoes off the walls. He's been dead for a thousand years. I face him, but only to take a step back. If the dungeon wants to strike him dumb for speaking ill, I'd like to be at least a bar away. I correct him. 1,248 years as of last Knox. The bright neon light hardens his skin into something like quartz. It looks dead, flat, by nature, not craft. But his eyes are alive with green and brown flecks. You think you're smarter than me, Rogor? Dragon lover? That word again. I know what anger does to my investigative skills, so I push against it, use it to forge new judgments of this boy. His clothes are high-end, a raiding brand named New Ferris, something out of Tungsten City, though he's obviously from the capital Wormdoom. His back is straight, but his shoulders are bent inward slightly, and he doesn't want to look me in the eye. Gather all these things together, and logic paints a picture. He was groomed. What's your name? I ask him. He squints at me. Hazel? Your last name? I know you have one. You're from Wormdoom. Fine. Ground marrow. And your name? I smile. I'm not telling you. He shakes his head. I bet you don't even have a name. I mean, that's what Tungsten City wants, right? To make sure no one matters? That city is packed to the gills with refugees from the enemy kingdoms. Even if you had a last name, I bet it wouldn't be connected to any of the keepers or champions. Not like mine. I let him rant like water against stone. He attempts to attack me with every poisonous thing he thinks about the openness of Tungsten City, about the principles of community, about the end of privacy and being recorded all the time. He drones on until, all at once, he stops. His voice raised to its highest pitch. He says, Are you going to keep going or what? I know how to bother him now. I see his weakness. Impatience. No, I think I'll follow you this time. Color finds its way to his face. So, he does have blood. Fine. I don't need your help anyway. But he gulps as he turns around, scans two openings, and leaves through the left one. After three seconds, I follow him, shadowing his steps at almost nine bars. He doesn't try to outclimb me, and honestly, I don't mind following him. Without having to make choices about direction, I begin to focus on the light, the tunnels, 
and the rock under my feet. That's when I notice the slightest vibration in the stone. I let the distance between us grow to ten bars, then a quarter block, a half block. The vibrations were the strongest a few tunnels back. When I return, I catch a slightly different light in the tunnel, white from the neon piping above my head, but something more familiar against the walls. Something blue. That means cobalt, and cobalt means blue craft, one of my strengths. I sprint down the tunnel, taking turn after turn, the light becoming brighter and brighter, my certainty clearer and clearer. Around the final corner, I find a passageway streaked with azure light. I almost forgot to investigate my surroundings before entering the room. If there's something dangerous ahead, I can't see any sign. The room is circular, a shaft extending into darkness. The light issues from a large blue glass gear connected to another metallic gear, like the inside of a machine, teeth cinched together. It doesn't move. What is it? The voice behind me isn't surprising. Hazel followed me. I don't know, I say, hearing the irritation in my voice. I only just got in the room. What about you? Do you know what it does? He sneers. Why should I cut a look across his face that could wound a feral wolf? No, he says. I don't know what it is. My strengths are iron craft and gold craft. My eyes widen. Two of the most heavy-handed crafts, of course. And you want to be a paladin? I say. Well, what are your strengths? My eyes fall back to the two gears. I'm not telling him what my strengths are. Not during a competition. Let's just figure this out. He follows me to the wall where the two gears are stuck. Looks like metcraft and bluecraft, he offers. Each of the gears hang on chromium fittings. And timecraft, though there is no mercury in this object, just chromium. He shrugs. So what does it... I place my hand on the blue glass gear and the mechanisms click to life. A thousand colors appear over our heads, the air filled with blue craft images, icons, and transparent words. Whoa, I say. Whoa, he says. Is it connected to Blue Link? Inside a dungeon? No, I've never seen anything like it. Must be a closed circuit. The blue craft holds all the relevant data. The met craft automates it. But the time craft, I'm not sure. He laughs. And it's different, not part of his fake exterior. It's an honest reaction to something in the room. He gestures to the floating icons, symbols, and images. Looks like a brain. Scanning the holograms again, I see what he means. A complex web of data and synapses. It extends into the dark far above us, lighting the cavern. Gossamer threads connect the image. The threads pulse with flares of bright light, traveling 100,000 routes. After a minute, all the movement resets and repeats itself. I think you're right, I say. This is Bear Cloak's mind. That was a long time ago. I glance back at the gears. Timecraft. Not in this room, I say. In this room, we're directly connected to his past mind. What are we supposed to do with this? Read it, of course. And how are we supposed to? Half of the traveling thoughts suddenly freeze. Hundreds of icons lose focus and retreat toward the back center of his brain. Something is happening to Bear Cloak, or rather, something happened to Bear Cloak, and we're witnessing it. Is he blocking things out? Hazel says. Like the pulling of a trigger, I know what event we are witnessing. This is the moment he became a champion, the day he made the Bear Cloak. But the cloak was used to block animal telepathy. You know, worm kind, as death, floaters, feral wolves. Everything's sentient, really. I don't think that's why he made it. I scan the blurred icons again, watch them try to push their way out of his mind. He's not blocking out psychic animal attacks. He's blocking out his own memories. Goldcraft This isn't working, Hazel says for the tenth time. Yet, I say, it isn't working yet. I complete one more set of gestures, simple ones. With the fuzzy icon in my hands, I try turning it over. I try pinching it, zooming out, zooming in, cutting its connection to the other icons. Nothing. Hazel groans. Do you know what you're doing? I release the icon from my hand, and it slingshots into place at the back of the brain. Let's see your bluecraft skills. Go ahead. All that gesturing is stupid. You don't see any gold mages using gesturing to, this is the challenge Bear Cloak gave us. We need to solve it. Hazel dusts off his hands and stands. Suit yourself. I'm moving on. 
Wraith spit. You think I care? You're no help anyway. Fine. His voice breaks a bit, and I have to force myself not to laugh. He storms from the room. With Hazel gone, my head starts to clear. Amazing what silence can do for the intellect. A pattern emerges within the blocked memories. They're all related to his father. An hour passes, maybe more. I'm not worried. The trial is not a race. It's a puzzle, regardless of what Hazel might think. I take the time needed and try every bluecraft gesture I know. I even try to bypass the images and reach the coding. Nothing works. I return to the gears and try to reset the whole thing. Maybe I missed something when it first turned on. The moment it flashes off, a solitary icon plummets like a raindrop and splatters against the floor. The whole room becomes a memory. Bear Cloak, or the boy who will become Bear Cloak, stands in a strange green light. His father kneels across from him, a loving expression on his face. Bear Cloak holds a shattered piece of bone, a skull with an elongated snout. The boy stares at the ground. I didn't mean to break it. You were being careless, his father says. His tone is explanatory, instructive. This man is Ingish. He reminds me so much of my father. I wonder if the dungeon is changing the memory. But no, at least I don't think so. Bearcloak starts to cry. His father takes the broken worm skull from his hands and sets it on the ground. He wraps his arms around him. It's just an old skull. But this is more than a child's memory. Why would his father have this skull? Hazel's accusation of me hangs in the air. Ragor, dragon lover. The skull is taboo. The history, the stories, the bones, the dried body parts of all dragons are forbidden, either by law or tradition. People from Ingal call them wormkind, but the last of all wormkind were killed a millennia ago. This is a dangerous memory, something not in Bearcloak's official biographical information. Like me, he had family from Ingal. I can't be the first one to learn this. The memory blinks out. A small pool of light gathers on the floor, and the raindrop reverses back into the sky, becomes a cloud, and evaporates entirely. I need to see it again, but when I turn around, the whole mechanism has disappeared. That's all you're going to show me, huh? The dungeon refuses to answer. Back to the maze. It takes a long time wandering through the corridors before I see another light. This time, the light is golden. Goldcraft is not a strength for me. I'll have to outsmart this challenge, whatever it is. But the sound of falling water invites me closer. As I approach the door, a thought strikes me. The shape of the tunnels. Why didn't I see it before? The long, winding routes, the gouges in the rock above, could very well have been dug by wormkind. Very large wormkind. Hundreds of thousands of people have come through this dungeon over the centuries. How is it possible there's no record of this connection to dragons? The soothing sound of the waterfall floats through the air as I come to the door. The gilded light spills out. On the right, sheets of crystal water cascade into a deep pool. To the left, two paths lead to dark openings on either side of a massive boulder. The room is only slightly bigger than the last. I skirt the edge of the pool, following a narrow path to the other side of the boulder. Behind me, something breaks the surface of the water. My heart jumps into my throat. Two hands claw at my feet but I stomp downward, spinning around to face this new challenge. Hazel's head comes into view from the rippling water. Ow! I reach down and pull him out. What are you doing in there? Out of breath, he flops onto his back, his hands wrapped around a glimmering chalice. What's that? I say. Now who's following who? I drag him the rest of the way out of the pool. What is that? Take a look. I reach for it, but he squeezes tighter. Just look. I'm not letting you touch this. The golden chalice is studded with opals in a circle around the rim. The bottom of the cup is carved in an intricate floral pattern. Goldcraft, what does it do? He stands and squeezes the water from his hair. Just about to find out. I follow him around the boulder and into the narrow passageway, but it comes to a sudden dead end. There's a door here. I know it. Maybe the goldcraft will give me strength to push it open. With one hand, he holds the chalice. With the other, he pushes. Nothing. He growls in frustration. I thought that would work. Or maybe... He pushes past me, back out to the pool. He dips his whole arm into the water, draws a large cupful, and guzzles it down. Anything? I say. I know what Goldcraft feels like, as if your whole body is sunburnt. He would feel it less because Goldcraft is his strength. He only smiles, 
passes me again, and returns to the door. His stance widens, his shoulders roll back, and he lunges forward. The door remains stubbornly in place. It has to be the second door. Second door? I follow him around the boulder, into the other passageway, but we stop short. Another flat stone door. He pushes again. Nothing. Mother's bones! Nothing is working! There are two doors, I say. So? There are two of us. If we both drink the water, it will open. He nudges me back the other way. Come on, hurry! We both drink from the chalice. He sends me back to the second door, and I don't argue. Might as well let him think he's in charge for a minute. I'm the one with the information from the other room about Bear Cloak's father, which means I'm ahead of him. His muffled voice reaches me from the other side of the stone doorway. On the count of three, one, two, I push with everything I have. Are you even pushing? He grunts from the other side. It's not working. We return to the foot of the pool. His hands are shaking with anger, the chalice trembling. Maybe, I say, there's another way to... He shouts a curse, hurling the chalice past the boulder. It clangs over and over again until at last it spins to a stop on the path. I shake my head. Emotion will only cloud your judgment. You need to... What? What do I need to do? This is as stupid as the last room. Nothing's working. He flees the room, mumbling about dungeons and dragons and blue craft and paladins and me. Why me? But I know the direction of his words. He's more upset at the world or himself than anything else. Yet, I say to his echoing footsteps, nothing's working yet. The chalice is dented, but it shouldn't affect the craft. I sit with my feet in the pool and think, turning the chalice over in my hands. What's different? My focus narrows on the waterfall. I didn't see Hazel when I came in. The chalice must have been deep under the pool, so I didn't notice him. But the water is more tranquil now. Why? I sweep the chalice across the rolling surface of the pool and drink, scanning my surroundings with a careful eye. There. Huh. The volume of the waterfall lessened. It takes three more cups until the waterfall is nothing but a dribble. The pool is a smooth sheet of crystal, and I can see my reflection. It smiles and winks. But I didn't smile. I didn't wink. I step back, afraid, and run into a body. A yelp escapes me, and I whirl around to find an exact copy of myself. Hi, Hi. we say. I could be looking at a twin sister. Goldcraft? Goldcraft? We ask. Duplication. Duplication. Sorry. Sorry. We both apologize for trying to speak over each other. I gesture for her to speak, but she gestures for me. We laugh. This This is is strange. strange. We gesture to the passageways and nod, each taking the closest side without discussing it. The moment my hand touches the stone, the seal breaks, and the whole slab rumbles upward. I'm facing my duplicate. After After you, you, we say. Budgecraft Talking seems to be working, but there's still a little overlap. We both laugh again, which gives my heart relief from the confines of this narrow hallway between rooms. It's pitch dark, and we have to grope over the stone in search of every turn, but we have each other, and I know I can trust her. The system we've created for communicating is starting to work. We've both been thinking the same things, so our rule is that I speak first, and she adds things. I look back at her, at me. You think we'll get out of this tiny hallway? I'd keep us. I hope so. I hate really small spaces, I say. Right, the tunnels I can deal with, but... Just talking about the tight space raises my pulse. I change the subject. There's a dull light around the next corner. I see it. I can barely tell we've entered the room. Piles of dark debris clutter the ground. A few low-burning fires, embers really, are scattered deep within the debris. Did we see this room in our research? My voice echoes off the faraway walls. Dumb question. I already know you didn't, right? I guess it's just nice to have someone intelligent to talk to. Yeah. So, what is all of this? My duplicate comes to my side and crouches next to me, lost for a second in the darkness until she stands again. Metal, she says. She's right. I can reach into the mass of things. Metal. Piles of tiny scraps. We need more light. If we can push through or around one of these piles, we might be able to get to some of those embers. Together, we step carefully through the refuse of metallic shards. Even when I draw a piece of metal toward my face, I have a hard time discerning what it is. 
Maybe it's all just scraps. I thought of that. If it's craftable, then we could use the embers to forge something. I groan. Us? Forge something? You know who would love this room? Don't say it. Of course I know. Sometimes it's not bad having a little brother who forges. We'll have to tell him about this when it's over. If only to make him jealous. She reaches the embers first. Grasping a large piece of metal pipe that she finds in the scraps, she stirs the coals back to life. The moment she peels off the top layer, a searing light floods the whole area. The metal piles glimmer and shine with gold and silver, with chrome and black iron. If these scraps were ever crafted objects, they've been broken down and stripped of any markings. I reach for the first thing that catches my eye, a small crescent of bright aluminum. Wait! My duplicate grabs my hand. She gestures with her chin to something in the pile, a translucent form scrambling, digging through the scraps. Spider! I jump back and my duplicate raises her long pipe like a javelin. We both crane our heads to get a better look at its translucent body, its gossamer legs clicking through the metal. It doesn't have eyes. My duplicate opens her mouth to speak, but then gestures to me. Not just a spider, I say. A scurry, yeah, okay. This might be good. We can use it. She smiles. Imagine what Hazel's reaction would have been. He would have killed it or run away screaming or whined about it. Her smile deepens. Is that what I look like when I smile? Hmm. Mischievous. So we use the embers to make something. But what? What do we need? We look at each other and say, A map. map. Can't hurt to try. Only a little, she says. I grip the piece of aluminum in my hand and kneel. Here, little guy. Come on. Fresh meat. Two other scurries emerge from the scraps alongside the first one I saw. Yeah, this won't be fun. The first one bites down hard in between my thumb and forefinger, but now I can sense its intellect. It will obey me. Find more aluminum. More of this. I touch the small piece I found to the spider's carapace. It skitters away in search of the metal. I repeat the process with the other two and stand. There. So should we make a crucible? But she's already combing through the scraps, looking for something we can use. In only a few minutes, we have a workable crucible made from iron. We calculate the heat it will take and dig a trench. Then we move heaps of embers into the trench. The scurries begin a small pile of aluminum at our feet, and it steadily grows as we try to work out how to make a map. Budgecraft is the only type of craft for map making and spatial manipulation. It can only be created from aluminum. What can we use to encode the metal? I ask. There are only a few things in the room not made of metal. The cave itself and the scurries. A ripple of discomfort sticks to my insides. I hate using animals in coding. It's the worst. Though we've had to do it before, it's a choice based on practicality. I know. Still, copper craft is our strength. Animal control, not animal harm. Right, but just one of the scurries will be potent. Okay, let's use rock from the cave and the embers and the scurry to affix the craft to the molten aluminum. We set to work. Our brother, Brig, would be proud. The scurries have amassed a good pile of aluminum scraps, which I place in the crucible. My duplicate brings back a few large rocks she must have chipped from the outer wall, setting them in the embers. The aluminum takes on a tan glow. It's working, she says. Now, the hard part. I entice one of the scurries closer. My insides turn. My mind flashes to Bearcloak, to the memory of his father. The world believes people like me, people from Ingal, to be closer to animals. This is borne out in the Coppercraft abilities of many of my people. Communicating with animals always touches something deep inside me, like stirring something ancient. I draw a large shard of metal from the pile. I'm sorry, I tell the scurry. It bends its eyeless head toward me as I stab through its carapace. My duplicate stands over me, arms crossed, angry. She feels the same way about this. When its long legs stop twitching, I take the whole spider and throw it into the aluminum. Neither of us can watch, but the smoke and the smell are unavoidable. We wait for a long time. I help my duplicate dig a long, shallow trough in the dirt at our feet. With makeshift tongs, I grab the crucible and pour the liquid into the trough. We cover the shimmering metal with more dirt. This is our mold. Once it cools, we brush the top layer of dirt away. She looks at me expectantly. I lift the long bar of crafted metal from the dirt, leaning against it like a walking staff. Nothing happens. 
It didn't work, I say. Where is Brig when we need him? I lift the staff and a spotlight shoots from the bottom. Whoa, Whoa, we say. What is it? I hoist the staff a bit more, and a strange pattern emerges on the ground, indecipherable. Maybe. She grabs the staff alongside me, but points the bottom toward the wall. The pattern becomes clear. Tunnels, rooms, blinking colored lights. She smiles again. We have a map. I really like this girl. Coppercraft and Tincraft Even with a map, the tunnels prove difficult to navigate. From the forging room onward, most of the paths are steep and winding. There are false rooms, broken paths, and collapsed tunnels. The dim light from the neon tube at the top of the tunnel settles on the room like a fog. My duplicate is beginning to prefer shadowed spaces. Since we first entered the tunnels again, her skin has begun changing to pale gold, first along the tops of her ears and her fingers, now the base of her neck. She catches me looking at her. It was inevitable. It's not like I could live beyond the dungeon anyway. I am a product of craft, made to help you problem solve. I'm not sure I'll exist once you leave the dungeon. But we have the same memories, same experiences. What if we had? The worse my skin gets, the more it feels like I'm forgetting things. Like what? Our mother's name? I know she's gone, and I'm sad about that, but I... I can't remember her name. Isadorna. Hmm. See, how could I forget that? It's beautiful, like her. Three years. It's been three years since I lost her. But knowing my duplicate could forget her so easily tears a small hole in my heart. When I get home, I'll find all my mother's files on Blue Link and memorize everything, again. Investigate her life like a true paladin. Proclaim her kindness and strength to the world. You're thinking about her? My duplicate says. Yes. Sorry, I didn't mean... Next turn. I aim the bottom of the staff at the wall to show the lighted map. The map glows green in the first room and gold in the second. One way leads to a tin craft room, the other to a new gold craft room. Tin craft, we both say. The tunnel curves, and we find the branches going right and left. We head right, another turn, another, and then green and copper light compete for our attention, spilling from a new doorway. I check the map again. This is the room, I say. But am I wrong, or do I see copper craft too? Let's find out. We crawl up to the entrance, finding a room very similar in shape to the blue craft room. But there is no glass gear. Four powerful lamps hang from hooks high on the walls, two with green light, two with copper. In the center of the room, a thick vine grows out of the stone. It is as wide as a splayed-out hand. Heavy, yellowing leaves sprout all along its blackened skin. The tip of the thing gropes upward toward the ceiling. What is this? I ask. Some kind of evil bean sprout? As I circle the plant from a distance, I find two watering cans sitting at the base. Look at these. One is tin, the other is copper. My duplicate sees them and moves closer. Okay, so tin craft for plants. That's easy. Let's keep our distance until we talk through this. Right, she says, but she skirts even closer to the vine and the watering cans as she strides over to me, almost testing the plant to see if it will react to her. It's something I wouldn't do without a lot of thought and investigation. She nears the closest watering can. It's got to be the tin craft. The tip of the vine twitches. Careful. My duplicate glances up. I think it wants to be watered. It could be a trick. Let's think through. She kneels next to the tin watering can. I take a step back, trying to widen my perspective, trying to understand what is wanted and what is needed in this room. Often things are connected in a dungeon. Bearcloak's mind, a goldcraft duplicate, the shape of the tunnels, the forge, and the sacrifice of the scurry. My mind threads together these pieces. Could there be a connection? I studied Bearcloak's life and his craft. He wanted to block out psychic animal attacks. Why? I squeeze my eyes shut, cutting off other senses, forcing my mind to fire more synapses. It's like an itch. There's something about the scurries, about where you can find them. That's it! My eyes snap open, just as my duplicate pours out the water from the kettle. Wraith spit. All the leaves become arms. The thick appendages shoot outward. They grab both of us, curling, squeezing around our bodies, lifting us in the air. The whole room fills with writhing plant life. No, not plant life. This thing 
is Wormkind, extinct in the real world, but in the infinite, changing rooms of Bear Cloak Dungeon, time and space can take on different shades. Things that are lost can be found, even dangers long forgotten. This false plant is called Wormvine, a type of dragon that digs and burrows deep into the stone, eating metals. It lives symbiotically with the scurries clawing inside its tough belly. They help break down metals. Its body? Hidden. Its face? Eyeless, but hungry. The room with the metal and scurries hadn't really been the belly of this beast. Had it? For an English girl, I'm not a very good Rogor. Help! My duplicate tumbles past my vision, a glimpse of her face and torso. She's covered with vines. I struggle to keep my arms free. The blackened vines scrape and tighten around the flesh and muscle across my stomach and back. There's pressure on my ribs. The barb of a thin vine whips around my wrist and lurches my arm backward. I howl in pain. Suddenly, a low copper light bleeds through the vines and shakes me free. I drop to the stone beneath. The center vine has quadrupled. Standing next to it, with the copper kettle in his hands, is Hazel. Miss me? No, I say. Give me that. I heard you yelling. I yank the copper kettle from his hands. Hey, stop, he says. We're good. You're free. Not yet. And Coppercraft is one of my strengths. Figures. But we should leave. There's a Goldcraft room. I can't leave her. What? The water in the copper kettle doesn't run out. I circle the monster, soaking the base of the central limb, and the vine begins to shrink. My duplicate comes crashing down on top of Hazel. They both groan as they stand. I keep pouring out water until the thing returns to its original size. Hazel's mouth is catching air. His eyes flick between the two of us. Uh, what's going on? There's... How did... Two of you? Wait. This must be how you got through the doors, right? Told you to be patient, my duplicate says. I stare at her. She's become less and less like me the longer she exists. I could say the same to you. Why didn't you help me think through that one? It didn't take long to figure it out, but a bit too late to stop you. Sorry, she says. I must be the impulsive side of you. I don't have one of those. Hazel grins. Oh, nice. This version of you is reasonable and apologetic. Not, Not to, to you, you, we both say. Hazel says, well, what did you figure out? The plant, I say. It's not a plant at all. If I'm right, it's Wormvine. Hazel shakes his head. Of course you would think that. We both shoot daggers in his direction. He throws up his hands. Fine. But what's Bear Cloak's connection to dragons? If we can figure that out, I think we'll find the exit. Ironcraft and Shieldcraft At the entrance of another room, the heat is so intense I can see it in the air. Sparks of fire and ribbons of distortion. Beads of sweat drip from our foreheads. The other me has become a mottled patchwork of gold and flesh, making the glistening of her skin look more like the inside of a furnace. We sure about this one? She asks. Our words and thoughts have been much further out of alignment. My heart shrinks a little at this realization. It's hard to find reliable friends. There's shield craft in this room, and we haven't encountered that. Best to try all the types of craft. And, Hazel says, the indicator showed Ironcraft, which plays to my strengths. Sure. Whatever competition sat between us at the beginning has been overtaken by the mystery of the dungeon. If Ironcraft will solve the puzzle, then I need Hazel. Come on, he says with a smile. Temperature is just right. The room is made of fire. From a small outcropping of stone, we look down into a pool of molten rock. A rough globe of obsidian with a hooked handle sits at the very edge at our feet. What is this? I say. Hazel tilts his head back and forth. His body straightens. Hmm. He moves through us, sweeping the ground with his feet until he stops. Here, help me. We clear the dirt away from the patch of ground he indicates. It's the same shape as the globe. Hazel smiles. We give him space as he grabs the globe by the handle and swings it over, setting it in place inside the divot. The stone behind us cracks. My hands fly outward, expecting the outcropping to come loose and plummet into the lava. But that doesn't happen. Instead, a small slice of the wall breaks away, revealing an iron bar descending along one side into the depths of the lava. I reach for it, but Hazel is quicker. He places a hand on the bar. More of the stone cracks away, revealing a blackened iron ladder, as if we're standing at the edge of a pool. 
My duplicate shakes her head. No thanks. A new light blossoms behind us. I turn and find a glowing object hovering within arm's reach over the lava. White light strobes like a pulse around it. Shieldcraft, I say. Hazel looks from me to the iron ladder, to the hovering light. Easy. So, you grab that. It will protect you. Then you come over to this side of the rock and reveal the rest of the ladder. Wait, my duplicate says. What do you mean? You want her to go into the lava? He shrugs. The shieldcraft should protect you. Except shieldcraft is a weakness for me, I say. Ah, uh, well, that shouldn't matter, as long as you're not a total null in shields. We're not, my duplicate says. She glances at the ladder. And it does look as if we're supposed to go down there. What do you think? Let's get the object and see. I hand the aluminum staff to her and march over to the edge of the cliff. She offers me her other hand. Keep your feet planted. Understood. With one hand clasped around her wrist, I lean outward and grab the object, metal knuckles made of tungsten. The knuckles are black, but the light they give off is stark white. I slip them onto my hand. My body sags with relief as an icy cocoon settles over me. I move to the ladder. As I put my foot on the first rung, the lava at the bottom of the ladder shifts, revealing another rung. Ha! Hazel says. See? Okay, you lead the way. It should have a radius that can protect all of us without a problem. I'm not going down there, my duplicate says. I'll get melted. Hazel shakes his head. You're probably better off under the shield and staying here. She thinks for a moment. Hazel's right, I say. I'm not feeling the heat at all. In fact, it's more like standing on a block of ice. You're safer with us. Besides, what if we can't get back to you? She chews on this and then moves forward. Hazel lets her go first. The effect of the shield has a wide radius as we move down the ladder like we're inside a bubble. We reach the floor. Somehow it's cool beneath our feet, the power of shield craft. All around us, the lava settles against an invisible barrier. The ladder connects to a railing that disappears into the lava ahead of us. Hazel keeps a firm grip. Another globe of obsidian appears at our feet. Hazel, with his hand on the iron, levitates the rock, moving it into another divot in the ground. He's controlling the obsidian with iron craft. As we move along the railing, three more obsidian globes appear, and Hazel sets them in place. My duplicate casts a wary eye behind us, toward the ladder, but it's lost behind a wall of lava. Great, she mutters. Hazel moves another globe into place. Relax, I think we're getting to the end of it. And he's right. The railing ends, revealing a final massive globe of obsidian, taller than any of us, against the far wall. This is it, I say. Hazel places both hands on the iron railing, and the massive rock begins to scrape sideways, revealing a small alcove with a shorter altar of sorts. On the altar, something rests under a regal cloth of deepest scarlet patterned with light stitching in a flaming pattern. I trade a quick look with my duplicate. She nods. We're thinking the same thing. Flames. The skull owned by Bearcloak's father. The scurries. Everything adds up to one thing. Dragons. Whoa, Hazel says. After one quick glance at me, he leaps forward and rips off the cloth, revealing a small gleaming object of copper and bone. He gasps. In only a whisper, he says, This is it. The answer. Wormkind. He shakes his head. I can't let you win. He picks up the long curved claw by its copper handle. My stomach drops. Don't! He makes a sharp intake of breath. His head and face begin twitching involuntarily, until finally, he lets out a long, hot breath and relaxes. When he turns to me, his eyes are pure copper. Spit and bones, my duplicate says backing toward the edge of the shield. Hazel, I say, put the claw down. His fist tightens around it. Put it down. Until this moment, I hadn't cared how tall he was or how strong. He barrels toward me. His shoulder hits my abdomen, and my breath is gone. My body and head crash against the stone. There's a burst of light, and pain lances through my skull. The second my vision clears, the claw flashes above Hazel, still in his hand, prepared to strike but it never comes. My duplicate jumps on him, yanking him away with the staff. They tumble backward. I sit up, but my head spins. My hand goes to the back of my skull, and I wince. It comes away, stained with blood. I squeeze my eyes shut. The shield, she yells. If you move away from us. 
They sound far away, as if at the edge of the shield. If I move the wrong way, they'll be burned alive. She can't want that. My legs wobble as I stand, but my mind refuses to focus. I've got to do something. I've got to act fast. But I'm frozen. How badly am I hurt? Hazel growls. He grabs the staff and drops to his knees, flipping her over his shoulder. She tumbles through the air, but he lets the staff go with her. My heartbeat seems to skip. I can see what is about to happen, but I can't stop it. Can't move fast enough. Mid-air, she bats the claw away from him as our eyes lock. Her golden face looks slick with liquid. All this because of a single motion caused by Hazel. Impossibly quick, her body folds into the wall of fire. She's gone. Hazel expels a giant breath. He drops to his hands and knees. His eyes are no longer filled with copper, but with tears. The claw is a few bars from his hand. No, he says. What? What did I do? I... That thing took over me. Finally, my feet move, though my head still pounds. Hazel whirls around. The shield! Quick! His voice squeaks, fearful. The crack in his voice leaves me hollow and afraid. I move to his side, but what we find beyond the wall of lava leaves me unable to speak. A pool of melted gold, cooling as we move closer to it. This is what is left of my duplicate. Born in the dungeon. Die in the dungeon. She's gone, he says. His face drops into his hands. Silvercraft. You tricked me, Hazel says. He turns to me, fists tightening. The shock is wearing off when I process his words. Tricked you? Into what? All that talk of wormkind. You made me think the solution was going to be related. So, that claw... He steals a glance at it. It turned me into... I wanted blood. Loman blood. My body temperature cools. I didn't tell you to pick it up. You might as well have. I jab a finger at him. You should have slowed down and thought about it. You can't blame your stupidity on everyone else. He pushes himself to stand. I'm not stupid. That shouldn't have happened. He's building up energy in his arms and legs, pacing. He's going to explode. I hold my hands up facing him. Dungeons are not safe. We both know that. And my duplicate, as terrible as this sounds, couldn't have left the dungeon anyway. He screams at the top of his lungs. Wheeling back his leg, he kicks the dragon claw into the wall of lava, then screams again. A child's tantrum. I should try to help him. I should say something. But what is there to say? Instead, I move past him to the small alcove with the altar. The red cloth lies flat on the ground. I peek my head into the alcove, looking upward. It's climbable, I say. I think there's another room up there. Hazel pushes me out of the way. I let him. In his emotional state, there's nothing I can say or do to help him anyway. He climbs on the altar and scrambles up the rock proficiently. I follow him. It might be three bars to the top, but he scales it quickly. Once I pull myself over the lip, I tuck the knuckles away in a pocket and take in the next room. No, not a room. An exit. Five rough doorways, identical to the 17 entrances. But a second altar stands between the two of us and the finish line. It's another bone this time embedded with silver instead of copper. I'd keep us. Hazel looks at the bone, then at me, then at the exit. Disgust colors his face. I'm done with this place. You? He turns his back on the altar and faces me, but the silver in the bone glimmers behind him. Hazel thinks winning is a simple matter of crossing the exit threshold. I know better. When a raider puts the mystery ahead of themselves, they're rewarded. Not to mention the connection this has to my heritage and culture. Bearcloak's father was from Ingal. This is the last piece of the puzzle. I must know what happened to him. Why did he make the cloak? What connection does he have to Wormkind? None of this is public knowledge. And good thing, too. What would people think of him, of his family? Hazel pauses. Look, I'm leaving. I think you should go ahead of me. Take the victory. You'll make a better paladin than I ever could. You'd give up winning? I thought I had this boy figured out. I was wrong. He shrugs. I guess. My mom and dad won't be happy. But maybe you'll find something that makes you happy. He starts toward the exits. Coming? 
Deep inside my body, in my veins, I sense a need to understand, to solve this problem. I focus on the glare of the white bone, on the carved silver handle. No. Suit yourself. Hazel chooses an exit without even the slightest pause and walks through. The only sound left in the room is my breathing, even and measured. In through the nose, out through the mouth, again and again, until I step toward the bone, trapping all the air in my lungs, my hand trembling. Whose bone was used to make this silver craft object? And who would forge such a thing? But I know the answer. It's not Bear Cloak's bone. His death, his physical body, created this dungeon, just like all the other champions. It's a large clavicle, male most likely. The only adult male I can connect this with is Bear Cloak's father. If that's true, maybe the champion himself forged this from his father's bones. Wraith spit. The craft behind this must be horrific. I steel myself against these thoughts and grab it from the altar, immediately sensing the silver craft. I get a feeling like a revelation, like solving a complicated math problem. And more than that, like someone is listening to my thoughts. I feel it. Hello? I say, suddenly wary of all the dark corners of the room. Is someone there? I am here. A child's voice rattles around my mind. Did you come for a story? I settle my breathing. Even for Loman, hearing voices is not a common occurrence. I, yes, I did. How did you make the cloak? That story? I don't like that story. Please? I need to understand. You have to tell me. No, I don't want to tell you. The bone must be connecting me with Bear Cloak, or at least a lingering memory of him. But I'll show you. The room slowly dims to black. Moonlight fills in my vision. Stars. I am up above, on the surface. How is this possible? I don't feel myself experiencing any of the negative effects of the surface. No fizz blood, no dizziness, not even a bit of nausea or a slight headache. But I know this is the surface. I'm surrounded by pine trees. The world is packed with snow, but my feet aren't cold. They don't sink into the drift where I stand, if I'm standing at all. The young bear cloak speaks to my mind again. I can't watch. Here. Take this. A glaring blue light fills the air near my face, and I squint. When I slowly ease them back open, I find a rod hovering at eye level made from blue cobalt glass. I know it immediately as a treasure beyond comprehension. A beholder. I whisper the word. To help you see better. I can't stay. His voice trembles, and the shard of bone in my hand disappears. The Surface only once in my life have I been to the surface. My mother took me there before I lost her. We watched the sun creep into the sky over a place the humans called Quandary Peak, Colorado. The kingdom of Rimdoom, far under the stone, an impossible depth without budgecraft to get you there. The sky was clear and new pink. She cried. We both did. I couldn't investigate or search my way out of that impossible situation. So, when I find a little child huddled against his father in the cold and snow, I can't help but think of that moment with my mother. The beholder can see every pulse, every electron that has ever been in this place. It's the simplest form of blue craft there is, not just for electricity and communication, but the beholder maps the very atoms of the world. I see everything in waves of electromagnetism. Bear Cloak's father has his arms around his son, protecting him from the deepening winter. You remember the bear we saw? He asks. The boy, shivering, nods into his father's chest. They're freezing. Use the copper ring I gave you. Call it to us. You're stronger. Nothing happens. I make a quick gesture and advance the time of the world. Minutes pass in only seconds. A bear wanders out from between the trees, growls, but then quietly pads forward and snuggles in next to them. The heat signatures of the father and son spike. They're going to make it. I'll go and find the budge port, the father says. We'll be home soon. We should have never come looking for that stupid bone, the boy says. I know. I'm sorry. He laughs softly. It has been an adventure, though. The father kisses his son's head and then scrambles over the drifts of snow. The time advances. Nothing. The boy is alone with the bear. Beholder in hand, I wander through the woods following the father's heat signature. I find him, shivering moving quickly, searching. 
but his haste soon gives out to the bitter winter. He curses. I'd keep him safe. What a wraith's cradle I've made. He tries to follow his own footsteps back, but there's too much snow and darkness. It was foolish to bring no other sources of heat and light. Generations ago, this was a Loman tradition. Parents would bring their child to the surface to experience the curse of Eid. Difficulty breathing, dizziness, fizz blood. Terrible. There were many accidents, but this one was never recorded. Shieldcraft can chip away at the worst of it, but no Loman is immune. Better to let the humans reign on the surface. I can't watch as Bearcloak's father begins to slow his breathing, his fingers growing blue. When I return to the boy, he's still safe and warm against the bear. I bring time forward again. Almost a day goes by. The morning arrives hidden behind a shield of clouds. Three women find the boy sleeping against the bear. The snow has stopped. They wrap him in a foil-lined blanket, and he budges, disappearing with the three women back to the safety of Rimdoom. The beholder glows, pushing the time further and further. The snow melts away, filling the rivers and streams across the mountain, pushing new life into the pine needles at an impossible pace. It becomes a spring and flowers burst all around me. Then I see him, the boy, only a few months older. A sharpened bone welded to a cruel piece of copper in his hands. He's no older than my little brother. My heart drops. It's a dragon bone. This type of craft is powerful, but unpredictable. Is that how he made the bear cloak? How it blocks psychic attacks? The same bear from winter wanders into view, a new layer of fat on its body. My stomach nearly flips inside out. The cloak would have needed to be made with a terrible amount of rare power. He wouldn't. No, please, no. But he can't hear me. I have to do this, Bear Cloak says, his eyes rimmed red. No more bones. No more ragor. No more memories of what happened. I have to do this. He charges the bear. I turn my head and skip the scene forward with the beholder. When I dare to look again, the two figures lay against each other. The bear isn't breathing. Another skip forward. He cuts the pelt free with the cruel knife. Every carving stroke and the world bursts with copper light. Another skip. He wraps himself in the fur cloak, standing as tall as a tree. A weight lifts from his shoulders. It's gone, he says. The pain is gone. Everything comes into sharp focus. His father's obsession with ancient bones. Their trip to this very mountain. The structure of Bear Cloak's young mind and how it had erased so many things connected to his father. The bear had saved his life in winter. He's used the power of that act to fuel the copper craft, to make this terrible cloak, to hide the memories of his father. The whole scene dims until I'm surrounded by shadows with only the light from the beholder. You understand now what I did? I do. I understand. I killed that beautiful creature because I was afraid. You were a child in pain. I'm sorry you went through that. I can't let you remember any of this. What? When you leave, you can't take this knowledge with you. In the pale light of the beholder, the truth attaches to me like a film. I always want the truth to be known, but somehow this is different. Okay, but can I at least keep what I felt? What did you feel? A need to remember everything. A need to protect others. You can keep those needs. A soft glow lays ahead of me. I press forward. I know at once I'm at the exit. Light bleeds back into the world. The second I cross over the threshold, my father charges me, squeezing me into a hug. You did it! You made it! I scan the rest of the exit lobby. The stone is lighter here than at the entrance. The only other person is Kiddo Bearkeeper. She nods at the beholder. That is a very rare gift. I... I can't quite remember how I got it. Kiddo bows her head slightly. That is the way of Bear Cloak Dungeon sometimes. Where is Hazel? I ask. I imagine he returned home. So am I? Kiddo inclines her head one more time. The gift will serve you well as a paladin. My father's smile wins over the light from the beholder. You did it. I watch his face. He's beaming. I take in the room. Every flicker of light, 
every bend in the stone. Something inside of me needs to remember everything about this moment. I capture it with a sweep of the beholder. I did it. I say, I'm a paladin. Tungsten City Only pieces of my adventure in Bearcloak Dungeon come back to me. I remember Hazel, the tunnels, the Goldcraft room, my duplicate, forging the map, and a room filled with lava. My duplicate died there, though I can't remember how. My dad insists on going to my favorite restaurant in Tungsten City, Kell's Lounge. Hundreds of people crowd the booths and tables. Holographic displays adorn the walls and glimmer from a dozen other places as people watch raiders enter the dungeons, battle monsters, and puzzle out difficult rooms. Dungeon raiding is everything to Loman. It allowed me to become a paladin. There are 93 known dungeons. They provide sport, religion, rite of passage, training, history, and scholarship. But in Kell's Lounge, the displays broadcast only professional raiders' teams as they try to make it to the heart of each dungeon. No one ever has. My brother, Brig, points to one of the displays. Ho! Oh, a bunch of latch mages trying to break down the Room of Solace in Doombeard Dungeon. Not likely. What's that object they have? I point to a long chain carried by three of the holographic raiders. Oh, that? It's a feed chain. I think they forge them. Brig tells me everything about the object, down to the recipe used to forge it. For once, I don't tune him out. He doesn't need to look up anything on Blue Link. The kid's mind is like a massive databank when it comes to forging. Since Bear Cloak, my mind has been hungry for new information, a deep need to understand everything around me. More than ever, I want to protect the vulnerable of Tungsten City. Whatever happened in the dungeon, it has sharpened me a true paladin. My dad opens the menu. Same as usual, or... I'll try the bread bowl soup this time, I say. Ah, something new. Guess I'll do the same. Brig mindlessly selects the pork sandwich, still spewing facts about foraging, rambling about how two different companies make the same object, though they encode it with different foraging recipes. My Blue Link connection chimes with a chat request marked private. Strange. I open it and find Hazel Ground Marrow smiling at me. Hello again, he says. How did you... You think because I'm living behind the wall in Worm Doom, I can't send a message out to Tungsten City? Well, yeah. I have a lot of connections here. My family. You know what? You don't want to hear all that. I just, I wanted to congratulate you. You earned your place as a paladin. I don't need your... I hear the edge in my voice. I'll never see Hazel again. He's locked behind the wall in Worm Doom. Why do I feel a need to be rude to him? Sorry. Thank you. And what are you going to do? He smiles. Failing that challenge was kind of great for me. My parents, for once, are open to other ideas. Something in Goldcraft or Ironcraft. I smile. You would have made a terrible paladin. I... you're right. Anyway, this line is going to close soon, and it cost a lot of ferrum to open this message in the first place, so congratulations. Hazel, I... how much do you remember from Bear Cloak? His face darkens. Same with you, huh? I remember saving you from that plant thing. I remember the waterfall and the golden cup, your duplicate. Once we reach the room with the lava, I don't know. It's like Bear Cloak erased that from my memories. Yeah. I checked the recordings of our raid. There are huge gaps. I... His image flickers in and out. Wraith spit. This thing is closing. Sorry. Hey, good luck out there. Same to... The image shatters. Brig cracks a giant smile. He opens his mouth to make a comment. Don't, I say. Brig glances at Dad, who gives him a warning look. Then he settles against the padded booth, turning his attention to the holographic display. Our food arrives, and we share a night filled with laughter and memories. The bread bowl soup is better than anything I've tasted at Kell's Lounge, and that's saying something. My dad shares a few new stories I haven't heard about him and Mom. Brig even keeps his motor mouth in check for most of the night. Even with all of this, something nags at me. Something at the back of my brain. What did I forget in Bear Cloak Dungeon? Why do I feel guilty about this amazing night, about Dad and Brig, and how much they support me? Something happened in Bear Cloak that changed me. I only wish I knew what it was. You going to answer that? Dad asks, breaking my train of thought. An official paladin request is chiming and a message icon appears, hovering above the table. I hesitate before opening it. This is my first paladin request. 
I want to remember everything about this moment. Before I open it, I take out the beholder. The people at the surrounding tables grow suddenly quiet. I can feel their eyes on me, on the beholder. My resolve crystallizes, and I stand from my seat. The request opens. A woman waits for help outside of Kel's lounge. Faram is being drained from her vault. I close the message and look at my dad. His tired eyes have an edge of mischievousness. The same look I saw in my Goldcraft duplicate in the dungeon. Well, are you a paladin or not? I'm a paladin. I rush out of the restaurant, beholder in hand. The nighttime view from Kel's lounge is awe-inspiring. The city cavern is massive, packed with stone and glass skyscrapers deep under the Rockies. An artificial moon hangs suspended at the apex of the cavern. The whole city is alive with neon light, a world of possibilities. I find the woman waiting on a bench half a block away. She stands when she sees me. Young for a paladin. Yes, how can I help? A man. He was following me. He slipped this in my bag. She holds up an aluminum cube. Then I got an alert over Blue Link that my vault has been accessed. Can you find him? One moment. I use the beholder to scan the scene backward in time. The world is overlaid with data and imagery. I rewind about ten minutes and find the man. I see him slip the cube into her bag. I compile all the data and enter it into Blue Link. Within a minute, another paladin finds him near the city center. I open the video for the woman, and we watch the other paladin and a few citizens corner the man. He's overwhelmed by the craft of the citizens that presses against him. Anti-budge so he can't get away, tincraft vines to keep his legs in place, and silvercraft to read his mind. It's a stupid mistake. The man was looking for easy ferrum, but he got caught. He'll be highlighted on Blue Link for everyone to see for a season. There, I say. Got it taken care of. The woman pats my arm. Thank you, paladin. A warm sense of pride swells inside of me. I did it. You seem new to this, she says. I'm just getting started. I hope you enjoyed listening to The Girl in Bear Cloak Dungeon by Ben Green, narrated by Corinne Norton. After listening, you know the world of Rim Doom is fandom ready with amazing characters and jaw dropping settings around every corner. If it's the fantasy world you've been waiting for, go to LoamSeedPress.com and grab book one of the complete trilogy today. You can also enter this month's giveaway because Ben has generously included the entire trilogy and ebook for our lucky winner. You can enter at FindingFantasyReads.com slash giveaway. As always, I will have links for those sites in the show notes. If you're enjoying listening to Finding Fantasy Reads, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help me know how to improve the show, whether it's to keep the things you like or get rid of the things you don't. And it helps new listeners find the podcast. A good review can often be the tipping point to get someone to listen or subscribe, which means I can keep making more new episodes for you. If you're not sure how to leave a review, check out today's show notes for some easy instructions. Thank you all for listening and happy reading. <laughs>